Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm on a number of other, other topics, but uh, it's the first time that I've uh, ever been asked to do one kind of in, the, in this context. <clears throat> I've done them with my partner before, but uh, it's the first time with that without her. And um, I just want to let you know that for where I'm at at this very moment in time, <clears throat> it is it is such an appropriate topic for me. I stand before you, I'm 53 years old, and for the first time in 23 years, approaching 23 years, I'm actually living with somebody again. So I spent 22 years and a few months alone and, and liked it, to be quite honest with you. There's a lot to be said for, for living alone, and I learned a lot in that period of time. I was other alcoholics. I was married to one of those three alcoholics that I hooked up with. The other two were just long-term, <clears throat> long-term relationships, quasi-live-in. But there's always been, a, always been a place, another house I could retreat to or that she could retreat to. And on September 22nd, that ended. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a, new, a new chapter for me. Uh, many years ago, my sponsor uh, lives in Little Rock. Uh, invited me to, uh, in a phone conversation, said there, there's a, her group does a little retreat every February, weekend, kind of little get-together every February. And so she said, we'd like to invite you down and you know, maybe, maybe talk in relationships or something. And, and so when I got the invitation to come to the, this getaway, this weekend event, the topic they had asked me to share on was sponsorship. So when I was speaking with her on my regular Monday night call, I said, uh, initially, you said you'd wanted me to talk about relationships, and she said, "No, Rick." She said, "Down here, we like our workshop shop leaders to know something about the topic they're discussing." <laughs> and so, um, the fact that a few years later I was invited with Lise to do one uh, showed me that at least she thinks that I'm getting to understand a little bit about what it's like to start using these principles as the basis for a healthy relationship. And when I was talking to her uh, not too long ago, um, <clears throat> three or four weeks ago, I was telling her everything that, that Lee's and Lee, my, my partner's name is Lee's. It's a French-Canadian name, a lovely woman. Uh, it's pronounced L-E-E-Z, Z, uh, but it's spelled L-I-S-E, Lisa with an E in the end, a very, very common French, French-Canadian name. So anyway, I was telling my, my sponsor about what Lisa and I were up to as we're getting ready to make this, this transition, and it had been suggested to us all the way along that neither that we not move into either one's house, that it was really important to start the relationship on an equal footing, and that you get your you get a house that's kind of an hour house or an hour place, as opposed to being her me being in hers or her being in mine. <clears throat> now that we're experiencing that, there's a lot of wisdom wisdom in it. And so anyhow, I'm telling her that we had done that, we'd made the purchase, and. and we went to see a mediator, we, all kinds of things. After I finished, I, I then asked her this question. I said, how does that sound to you, everything that we're doing, in very real terms for this relationship? And she said this amazing thing to me. She said, it sounds smart. And nobody ever in my life had ever put the word relationship and smart in the same sentence. Ever. Relationship and stupid relationship and what were you thinking relationship and you did what all that made sense for the history of of what i what i had been up to for for all too long and so i took that as a real compliment uh, from her that, uh, that that we were actually making some clear change <clears throat> and that is our message isn't it that we don't need to do anything perfectly but when we apply these things that we do start to do things better and that, what a great freedom that is. So when I was speaking to Jenny about, about this workshop, I said, is there a, <clears throat> a format you would like me to use? You know, a number of people do it different ways. And she said, basically, we'll leave that up to you. And so I, I, um, I've done them where I just kind of basically it's another talk, which is what this might turn into be, or, or a talk with questions or people coming up to share. So let's kind of see how that how that develops. I just have some things written down to keep me on track. 
And uh, in doing this, I, I'm taking the cue from my sponsor as I take so many things from my sponsor. Um, if, if I, in, in the way that she shares. I said to my sponsor one time, it's one of the few disagreements we've had. I, I, just, I just said, you know, you're, you're such a, you, know, you speak so well. And she said, you know, I'm not really a very good speaker, but I'm a good storyteller. And I said, well, I beg to differ. I said, you're a great storyteller and a terrific speaker. And so I take my cue from her is that she's very clear all the time when she shares to really share her experience, not to just talk around something, but to give you very clear examples. And for me, when I hear that, it gives me something to attach to. So instead of talking around relationships, I'm, I, I'll do that a little bit in the beginning. <clears throat> but I'd like to give you some very clear examples about how these principles are working in relationships with me, with my sponsor, and how I've learned from her, with Liz, with my sister, with my mother my, and my father, and a couple of the guys that I sponsor. So that's kind of the format, uh, <clears throat> the menu that I've laid out here. So it's very clear that, that many of us, certainly me, have had challenges in this area. That we get, we start to get, in AA, I guess, sober, but we start to get a little bit of serenity when you're in Al-Anon. Things start to, start to clean up, but, but the relationship thing seems to be a mystery. And that certainly was the case with me. As one ended, like I told you earlier, I, I chose another and found yet another and in, in the midst of, of those three alcoholics, I also found a few food addicts. Like I went out with this woman one time who would not eat all day. She would eat nothing all day but carrots. And she started to turn orange and drink coffee. And, and at the end of the night, she would make up a massive pot of food, eat that, and then eat a box of fudgicles. <clears throat> and then, then, then drink warm water. And I didn't get it. If she was drinking a bottle of whiskey, I'd get that. But the food thing I didn't get. And one night I made the mistake of asking her if I could have a fudgicle. And she almost bit my head off. I said, I'm out of here. But I've never done that with the alcoholics. It's a funny thing. I, I don't know what that is. That, they, that someone might have some other kind of thing. And, and I just didn't get it. And I, and I left. But the alcoholic thing. Really, really, really. This, that, that's a real hook for me. For whatever that. Whatever that's about. But, but the relationship challenges aren't just with the spouse, the primary love relationship, or for whatever whatever word you want to use. I'm not married, but we're certainly now living together. Uh, with kids, the issue with kids when you're divorced, those, those relationships, how do they happen? Relationships with, with exes, with initiatives that I've had, with parents, with siblings, with other, other with four co-workers. It seems to go, go on and on. Is how do we kind of connect with all of these people? As that was my yearning. I, I wanted to connect. But I just seemed incapable of doing it. And I was in this fellowship for way too long without a sponsor. <clears throat> and finally, when I got one, she, she was real clear with me. And one of the first things she said to me around this area was, Rick, it has to be in this order. It has to be God first, you second, the other person third. And I, it took me a long time to get that. And she told me there, she said that, and that's kind of the wisdom of waiting the year. We hear that kind of folk wisdom in our fellowships all the time. Get into recovery, kind of don't make any major decision for a year. Kind of stay out of a relationship for a year. Well, it's not just stay out of it for a year and do nothing. It's kind of stay out of it and start to really actively work these 12 spiritual principles. Start to work these steps because it starts to get us out of, out of ourself. And my, me in relationship was completely 100% about me. That's what it was. And so I needed to kind of keep that, 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 that God on the front end. And when, when we do that, then we can begin to use, because I've actually started to have some kind of spiritual awakening. doesn't mean it's over, but there's always this ongoing awakening in the spirit. But then I can actually start to use some of those tradition principles in relationship. So here's the idea that she gave to me. She said, we have the traditions to keep our groups unified Look at every relationship in your life as a group. Now that was a pretty good little bit of information and a pretty good little angle to look at things. So we start to look at those traditions and they work so well 
well, really well for us. I, I just reminded, I don't know why, of a little, little story. I, I, I met a guy one time, his name was Circe. He, I, I understand him to have passed away. I only had to, he, at the time I met him, he was the longest person with the longest sobriety I had ever personally met. And so I made it a point to go talk to him. I just thought it was so cool to met somebody who had been sober that long, and he met Bill and all that stuff. So he told me this funky little story about Bill had come to Texas, and Circe was showing him around. And when they were on the train going from one town to another, Bill pulled out of the breast pocket of his jacket a, a handwritten set of 12 things, and they were the traditions. And he read them to Circe. And Circe looked at Bill, and he said, well, you know, Bill, you might need those in New York, but we're okay in Texas. <laughs> I just love that story. But the traditions have been adopted well by us, and, and if we take them and expand them beyond, so if we take a look at step 12 that says we practice these principles in all our affairs, well, let's take a look at the principles and broaden the principles out just from the 12-step principles. Take a look at the tradition principles, and how am I going to use those in the context of relationship? The program allows us to make amends. And aren't they sometimes the most powerful stories that we have to share with one another? It's the incredible power of making amends. Sharon did that so well, and she told that story about sending letters to her, that letter with the checks to her dad, the story about me making the amends to my father with the, with the letter I sent him. So the amends allow us to kind of repair in whatever way God will allow that to happen, old relationships, and to move forward. Thank God we have that, because it is possible. My sponsor is a great example of that for me. She was in this alcoholic hell for a long time. And today she's married 30, 35 plus years to the same man after having gone through that, both of them practicing these principles together. And I see that it is possible to go through that drinking active kind of insanity of what the act of drinking is and both start to get better and use those things because there is a love underneath all that. I've seen that happen. And what it also allows us to do is we can start new relationships in a different way. So where there's no kind of terminal thing here. The old ones, we have a way to make amends and move forward. And what better way to move forward with an amend that you make in a relationship than just being a better person with that person, having a different attitude, a different approach, showing up on time if you say you're going to show up on time, et cetera, et cetera, with that, with that person. So the program really gives us an opportunity to do that. And what the traditions really do is they just teach us how to live successfully with other people. Because I need to do that. I was a real loner and isolator and can still do that. But I really don't want to be that way. It's this kind of, it's a defense mechanism. But I really want to be connected. And the traditions have shown me how to, how to do that. So here are some of the key tradition principles that I use and we'll give you some examples for. One of them is autonomy. So we talk about autonomy in our traditions. I need to have autonomy in my relationships. In the old relationships, there was no such thing as autonomy. It was complete and total enmeshment. Instant enmeshment. You meet, you're in bed that night, there's this, this forced instant kind of intimacy, but it's really not there. And, and, and it takes a long time to get out of it. And that was just the ongoing regular story of myself getting involved. Attraction rather than promotion. How many times did I pretend to be something I'm not just so that I could get into a relationship with somebody or get into bed with them? <laughs> Sometimes it's talking about getting in a relationship. It really just means it's the sex part. When I was in high school, I did a personality test as a part of a retreat thing we did with my um, <clears throat> senior class. And the, the results came back for me and it, it, it said that uh, my, my major personality description was amorphic. And I didn't know what that meant. So I asked the person, and they said, well, it just kind of means you shape yourself around whoever you're with. And I said, well, that's good. It means I'm flexible. <laughs> and they said, no, it's not good. It, doesn't, it means you don't know who you are, is what it means. And so that's me. So there I am, this, this kind of this blob, kind of want, wanting to connect, but not having anything secure to give you to connect to, so I just kind of glom on and become whatever it is that you wanted me to be and then get mad about that. And so really, it's a silly because you see the attraction rather than promotion. The attraction rather than promotion that we use in our fellowship basically says, come to our meeting, come to our conference, come to meet us because who we are, this is what we do. We don't have to pretend to be anything other than what we are. 
We're a group of people who identify with one another, share our experience. We practice a, pro a program together, and this is who we are. If you want this, it's yours. If not, well, go practice out there a little bit more. And so if I use that in relationship, who I am right now is good enough. That's a very powerful principle in relationship. How about showing up? When my first, when my wife, the woman I married, that trumpet player, when she left, she said, I never felt that you would ever be there for me. And she's right. You know, our fifth tradition talks about us kind of being there for being, welcoming and giving comfort. That means we're there. We are in the meeting. That new person comes in, we show up and step up with them. We shake their hand, we talk to them, we share a little bit with them. What, are, what Am I really doing that at home? Am I doing that with these people I'm in, in primary or, or parent relations? Am I really showing up for my parents? Am I really showing up for the person that I say I love? Am I really doing that? It's a great principle. There's one authority, and I'm not it. There's a loving God. When I left on Friday morning to come here, when I woke Lise up to, to kiss her goodbye, and, and she said, um, she said, do you mind if, my, if I give a key for our house to, our kid, to my kids? Because she has three children. I have no grown children. I have, I have no children. And I said, well, I think we need to talk about that. And then she said, yeah, let's both of us pray about that. And we do that a lot in our relationship. We pray about things. We'll pray together. We'll talk about it. We'll separate. But we'll bring God in. And that's what one of our traditions is. We have, but one, uh, we have like this one authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. And so why can't I have a group conscience with my partner about things? And, and they're about very practical issues. Practic like that's kind of relation. We get hung on the small little things in our relationship. You know, she seems, may seem to think it's okay to leave her underwear on the tap in, this, in, the, kitchen, in the bathroom sink. It bothers me. But if I don't say so, I'll never know that, that, that it bothers me. And it really, I know it really bothers her that I leave my socks on the coffee table in the family room. It just really bothers her. So I make, she told me that. Okay, so I just be a little conscious. <laughs> but when I take my socks off, that I actually bring them up and put them in. But it's a little stuff that will kill. Every time it's a little stuff that will get you. But there's one authority. We have no other affiliation. That's an important one for me. Like we're it. Like we're in. I've made that commitment. How about self-support? I always looked for you to support me. Basically, my, my idea of a perfect relationship was this. How infantile is it? But this is what it was. It said, I want to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, in whatever way I want to do it, and I want you to dedicate your life to supporting me to do that. That is fundamentally the way I approached relationship. And clearly, that's one of the reasons they didn't work. It had 100% to do with me, and I just kind of want you to kind, kind, kind of be there for, for, for whatever. Very immature, but and did anybody ever tell me that? No, but did that develop? Absolutely, it did. So we talk about Tradition 7, being self-supporting, having two people choosing to come together instead of these two weak people just like kind of collapsing onto one another. Uh, anonymity, kind of the selflessness, like it says so great, like Jim actually read it in the, uh, out of your program. I think I have one here. So what does it say in, in, in your program here? It says that the tradition of anonymity is far more than a sound public relations policy. It is more a denial of self-seeking. So how do I kind of take the self-seeking out of the relationships that I'm in and start to actually show some interest and attention to the person that I'm with? And unity. Isn't that the granddaddy of them all? It says that kind of in the triangle in the air. We are joined by a mutual desire to have a healthy relationship and the life of that relationship depends on unity. It really does. So when I asked my sponsor to sponsor me and she sent me that package, the package was a, a thing about steps, but it was also a, a tradition thing that she had done based on her experience with people in program who after a long time of being and working the steps and going to meetings, being active in Al-Anon and some in AA, but mostly in Al-Anon, were finding that all of their relationships were falling apart. And why is that? And that is too common a story that we, are, we come into recovery, and then the relationship ends. I heard a woman uh, say it many years ago. She said this, relationships born in sickness rarely survive health. Well, I'd say that they can, they can survive health if two people are willing to work at, to, at kind of bringing these principles in that they can. And so she came up with this thing that she calls traditions as a guide to healthy relationships. And that's kind of basic, and that, that's really been infused in me in the years that I've had the opportunity, being really blessed to, to, to work with her. 
And so this is the only thing I'm going to read to you. And I'd like to read to you these 12 traditions with a focus on healthy relationships. So this is it. Traditions as a guide to healthy relationships. Number one, our common welfare comes first. A healthy relationship depends upon unity. Number two, for our family or relationship purpose, there is but one authority, a loving God as he expresses himself in our informed family conscience. Each partner is God's trusted servant, neither governs. Quite pretty good. Number three, two or more persons, when gathered together for mutual benefit, they call themselves a relationship for mutual benefit. The basic requirements for a good marriage or relationship are a mutual desire to be in that relationship and a willingness to make it work. Four, each partner should be autonomous, except in matters affecting the other partner, the family or relationship or society as a whole. Number five, each marriage or relationship has but one primary purpose, to serve as an expression of God's love. I love that. Number six, a partner ought not be overly supportive, overly supportive spiritually, emotionally, or physically to the marriage or relationship, lest problems of ego gratification divert him or her from the primary purpose, which is to serve as an expression of God's love. Seven, each partner ought to strive to be fully self-supporting spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Eight, our marriage or relationship should, re- should remain forever a free, giving relationship, one to the other. Number nine, a family or relationship should be pliable in its organization, but our group conscience may appoint certain persons responsible to serve various functions. Ten, a relationship should avoid heated controversy. Has there ever been any good that comes out of just like a battle? I don't th- I've never had it. Number 11, each partner best conveys his or her beliefs and philosophy by attraction rather than promotion. Anonymity is a valuable asset to the marriage or relationship. Number 12, selflessness is a spiritual foundation of our way of life as marriage partners or friends, ever reminding us to place principles above personalities, and the principle is unselfishness. Good stuff. That's like a whole weekend right there. I just wanted to read that to you. Lisa and I, um, a few years into our relationship, started uh, uh, with the direction, of, kind of with guidance of my sponsor, a couples meeting. So where her and two other couples would get together and would use those traditions and kind of talk about very real things that were going on in our lives. And it was a terrific group. We went through the book a couple of times before we disbanded it. But it was marvelous to gather together as six people. There were three couples committed to one another. One was married. Two were married. There, and there was her and I at the time. Um, And how marvelous it was to explore together bringing these tradition principles in very real terms into our relationship and to see again how selflessness is the key to the whole thing. That's the key. Not, I want you to dedicate your life to supporting me and everything I want you to to do. I want to dedicate my life to being us mutually supported. So I'd like to tell you some stories. And first off, I want to start start talking about the relationship I have with my sponsor. It's, I've come to see over time that it may not be a common relationship that I have with my sponsor, but it is the exact one that I need. And it is beautiful. The word sponsorship no longer fully covers or can encapsulate what it truly has grown and developed into. And, and this is the blessing of what we get to do when we can become dishonest with each other and continue to work together. What I shared in my talk was that when after I did my fifth tradition and I said to her, I remember after I did my fifth step, I said, you know, there's not a single thing I've left out that I'm aware of. And she told me that she loved me more because she knew me better. It was so landmark. To this day, it rings a reverberation in my soul. And the thing that's even more important about it is that she knows absolutely more than any person on the planet. She knows me, and she still is with me, and that I can still have that relationship with her. 
And that's the wisdom of this experience of, of sharing this with others. I know in the big book it talks, you know, you can do it with your spouse or do it with a clergyman. Uh, that's not my experience. I did it with a sponsor. And I needed to do it with a sponsor that I was going to have an ongoing relationship with. And putting it all out there and finding that we can still be friends, we can still be together, is amazing. And I use that kind of as a bedrock for everything else. And that's the attraction rather than promotion thing. That I, who I am is good enough. I'm striving to be better, striving to change. I'm not perfect, but I am better. And I don't need to, to wrap myself or form myself like, like silly putty around somebody or something. It's like if somebody asks me what I like, I can tell them. So what do you like for dinner? Well, what do you like? What kind of movie would you like to go see? Well, what do you want to see? Where would you like to live? Well, where would you like to live? What color would you like on the wall? Well, no, what color would you like on the wall? Like, like it's just so icky. And who wants to be in a relationship with that? And so you kind of can, can stand and say, bang, because who I am right now is good enough that I do have an opinion, I do have feelings, and I can just state them. It was amazing what, what, that, what, that, what that gave to me. Now, the fact that I have this, this long-distance relationship with my sponsor means that we have to talk on the telephone. And that's our primary way of communicating. I email a gratitude plus tour, um, and I visit her two or three times a year. Um, it's amazing how much how we've been able to connect given the distance. But what what I've become through making that commitment is dependable. And boy, that's 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 a relationship principle. Is am I doing what I say I'm going to do? And so I would call every Monday night at my at my. Um, designated time, which is 10 o'clock my time, 9 o'clock hers. Now, one night I missed. It's the only night I've missed in the whole, I think it's 13 or 14 years that she's been sponsoring me. And the reason I missed was because my call-in time used to be midnight. She was a light night owl, so was I. And that, the, that day, I had taken my music student down to a breakfast TV show. It was at Christmas time. And we were playing on this breakfast TV show. So I'd gotten up at 4 a.m., to fetch the kids, get the instruments, go down to this TV studio and do this, do this morning show at like 7.30. And so by midnight, I had simply just fallen asleep in my chair. And she called me and said, Rick, you didn't call. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I said, I, just, I fell asleep. And she said, it is so unlike you not to call. The previous Rick, it would have been so unlike Rick to call. It had flipped. Just by making that commitment. Hey, I want what you've got. She's willing to sit there on the phone waiting for me to call. I'm going to make that call. And the only one time that she's never been there when I called, actually I didn't even call, but she has one sister. She has one living relative and her sister had a heart attack. And in the midst of the possibility of her sister dying, she remembered that she had made a commitment to this guy in Canada all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas. And she called and left a message on my machine and said, Rick, Dorothy had a heart attack today. I don't think I'm going to be at home to take your call tonight. And that sealed it for me. I said, that's what commitment's about. In the midst of that, she remembered that I was going to call. And she didn't want me to just get the answering machine. What a fantastic principle to bring to all of our relationships. At work, our parents our kids, spouses, just in general. What a fantastic principle that is to bring. And because my relationship with my sponsor is long distance, that means that I don't get to see her when I just go to my regular Tuesday night meeting. It means that I have to make a, a trip to see her, or she makes a trip up to see me, which means that we get to live together. And so what that has allowed me to witness is an example of her and her husband, who has just become blessed to me as well. His name is J.D., just a wonderful, wonderful man. I've been able to witness their relationship. I've been able to witness, as an observer, allowed into their home, simply because I said, will you sponsor me? A growing, loving relationship based on these 12 steps and 12 traditions. And that is something that I was just able to see. And we can be powers of example to one another. And so when I see somebody knowing the hell that they went through, sitting at night after being married for 30 years, sitting on the couch together, simply holding hands, 
were at a conference and they walk down that way. They walk down the aisle holding their hands, or he opens the door for her. They think that's. I need to learn that. I need to learn that. And thank you, God, for allowing me to witness it, to see that. I've asked them about money. Isn't that a stickler in a relationship? The cash. How does that work? So I said, how do you and JD handle the money? And she said, well, Rick, the thing that's really important to understand about handling the money is not how you handle the money, but that you agree on how you handle the money. That's the key. And it was that simple little thing that really helped me because my orientation to money when I was married was really simple. I work and I keep mine and you work and I keep yours. And I'll, I'll give you an allowance from your salary. And i guilty. I did that. And I will spend all of your money and whatever I want to spend on and I'll give you this, this pittance. And every Saturday morning when I was married, I, I had a ledger. And I would say, can I see your credit card receipts? And I would keep track of her credit card receipts. And she would get upset. And I said, why are you getting upset? I'm just keeping track of things. It was, a, it was horrid what I did. But I am guilty of doing that. And was there ever a discussion one single time about that? Never. That's just going to be the way it is. Her money was deposited into my bank account. Oh, no wonder she left. You start to take a look at all that stuff. So it's not how you it's not how you handle it. It's that you agree on how it's handled. So now that I'm entering into a very significant financial deal with the one, it's not a significant financial deal, but, but now that our finances my finances are once again intertwined with another person, I can guarantee you we are doing it very, very different. And we haven't had a fight about money yet. We've we're, we've agreed on how we're gonna handle it and we're following through on it. And it is amazing. Because it stops being an issue. I was used to think the money was, the, the issue about money was I don't have enough. That was never the issue about money. So if I had 10, I wanted 15. I thought 15 would do it. If I had 100, give me 150, that'll do it. If I had 10,000, I want 15,000, that'll do it. I knew a woman in Allen one time whose husband had a very successful business. And in, 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 in addition to his, the assets in his business, he had $4 million in a bank account. Just sitting there. In addition to everything else he had. And she shared with me one day that he said, if I have 10, I'll be okay. And I was like, I'll be happy with three. <laughs> but it, I've never forgotten her sharing that with me. Because you see, the money is not about the money. It's about something else. It's about lack. It's about not feeling have enough. So when we have accepted that we, this is what we've got, and this is how we're going to do it, it is amazing how calm getting the mail is. Opening up the bills. We've written it. We know what's coming. We know what we're spending. We know how we're dividing that up. I mean, it's, it's truly blessed. And that came from one simple thing. Mary Pearl, how do you and J.D. do that? And she said, Rick, it's not how we do it. It's that we agree on how we do it. Thank you. I was sitting in the backseat of the car when they said that to me. Amazing. And it's also amazing how when you just reach out to somebody and say, because basically what's asking someone to be your sponsor is, is you say, I like what you've got. How did you get that? I like where you are. How did you get there? That's what that is. And she showed me how she got there through her experience. That's the only thing we can share with any legitimacy is our experience. But over time, these relationships grow. And it's amazing how she has become integrated into my life. She has been to my home. She has been to my workplace. She has, she, she's, she's met my friends. She's met my, she's sat down and had dinner with my father. She sat down and had dinner with my mother. I've been to her, I've met her sister. I've been to her sponsor's house. It was marvelous to go to my sponsor's sponsor's house and watch my sponsor be sponsored. It's absolutely lovely. When my dad was, my dad was taking a winter a holiday down in, in Texas that last year, and he phoned, he said, hey, do you, do you have your sponsor's phone number? I'm driving through Little Rock. Maybe I can, I can just kind of give her a call or maybe go visit her. My dad, visiting my sponsor. It, it just, it develops when we show up. And when we're not, we don't have to hide anything. When we're just kind of open. It, it really, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And that has become, for me, that primary sponsorship relationship has become the example and the bedrock that I use for all of the other relationships that I have. 
her power of example, the wisdom, the things that I have gotten to see. My partner, Lise. Lovely woman. One thing being with an alcoholic, she, Lise is an Al-Anon. It's quite another thing to be with an Al-Anon. Kind of just who obsesses about who. I don't quite, uh, I don't quite know. And, you know, we talk about loving detachment in Al-Anon, but this is the first time I've been lovingly detached from. It's kind of not, so I, I kind of have some, I have some empathy now for the alcoholics who get lovingly detached from because that's happening to me. And she's saying things to me like that, that I, would, I would hear other people say, you know, it's like, you could be right. <laughs> now one of the greatest things the Al-Anon can say to the alcoholic? You know, they're often doing something. You could be right. So I'm often some little thing, flight of fancy. She says, you could be right. I know what you're doing. Yes, you do. <laughs> but you still could be right. So that is a challenge in and of itself. These two Al-Anon are being together. And so I, I know a couple, uh, an Al-Anon couple who lives in, live in Omaha. And so I, I met with them one, I just saw them one time and said, how are you doing this? The two Al-Anon thing, not the Al-Anon AA thing. And, 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 and what the, the fellow said, his name is D. He said, well, number one, he said, I don't know how anybody can do it without each person being sponsored. Number one, I have absolutely no idea how that, how that can happen. But he said, number two, respect each other's program. Whew. Don't get in their face about their program, how they're practicing their program. Are you calling your sponsor? Don't get in theirs. And we don't go to the same meetings. It's really important that we keep that separate. She has her program. She has a great sponsor. Sometimes I might say, you talked to Helen lately? <laughs> then every once in a while she'll come downstairs and I'll say, you just talked to Helen. Oh, yeah. I said, thank you. <laughs> and I know she says that about what after I've talked to mine. Because I don't know how we do this without a sponsor. But so that, that's our experience. And it is important for me to be with somebody who wants to live by these spiritual principles. That is just an important thing for me. And that means that we're going to meet people here. But this is not a meat market. So there's this funny little thing. How does that happen? Heard a guy use this, this gag line one time. He said, you know, if you're coming to AA or Al-Anon to find a partner, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to Lee's all the time, I said, you got an oddball here, honey. <laughs> But anyhow, I, I'd, I'd had these, these, you know, this marriage and then the, these two long-term relationships with these alcoholics, you know, alcoholic one, two, three. And by the time the third one ended, um, this, my sponsor said this to me. She said, Rick, I think you need to take some time off. It means celibate. That means sponsor speak. And so I said, how long? And so she said, four months. She said, it'll end in December 31st. I visit my sponsor every year. And so... I said, I can do that. I can do that. She said, what that means is that you need, you're not going to, it's not that you're not going to, you're not going to date anybody. But she said, you have to discover, Rick. You absolutely have to discover. If you're going to have any kind of healthy relationship with a woman, that women are people. That a woman can be a friend, Rick. Not just a sexual partner. You've got to learn that. And she said, also, you need to learn, Rick, that you will be okay on your own. Because you don't know that. I said, no, I don't. And so she said, I want you to discover that women can be friends that you can have conversations with. And you go home and she goes home. You have to find that out. So you got four months. I said, okay, I can do the four months. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking... Four months is up on December 31st. Like this Playboy bunny is going to come running through the door on New Year's Eve. I mean, on New Year's Eve, and it's like a hot dog. Here we go. And on December 31st afternoon, I'm talking to my sponsor. We're getting ready for a little party, and I said, "Hey, my four months is up tonight." She said, "Yeah, I know. I've been meaning to talk to you about that." And I said, "I knew you were going to do it." She said, "What do you think about extending it to a year?" And I said, "I think it's a good idea." Then I kind of bit my tongue and went, "Did I say that? <laughs> Let me take that back." But she was right. I needed to continue to discover that women are people that I can talk to, enjoy as friends, but not always be trolling. 
very important for me. And so I started to do that consciously. And when the year was up again, I think the play by buddy is going to come running through the front door, and that didn't happen. And so I talked to my sponsor after the year. She said, well, now let's just see what God has in mind, Rick. And so I continued to do what I was doing, and I was starting to find that, you know what, I am okay. I can wash my own dishes. I can cook my own food. I can wash my own clothes. I can look after my house myself. I can enjoy just kind of going out with somebody and getting to know them a few times and realize, nice person, not good relationship material. That's amazing. Because when you're just getting into it, instant. You never have time to do that. Boy, what an amazing experience that was. And so the one year turned into two. And I'm talking to my sponsor and thinking, you know, this is going on kind of long. <laughs> she said, Rick, God has a plan. You haven't gone this far to just let it go. I said, okay, I'm going with you on this. Year three comes and goes. I have needs. <laughs> she says, Rick, you've come a long way. Year four comes and goes. And by then I'm thinking, I'm going for the record. I don't care anymore. It just, it just didn't matter. It just didn't matter. I, was, I, I had developed this fabulous circle of friends. And I was truly enjoying everybody. Man and woman, I had found out that really I can be okay on my own. I had never experienced that in my entire life had I experienced that. It was beautiful. And it wasn't isolation. It was just some, some kind of solitude. I didn't have to depend on somebody else to do things. God, it was, it was beautiful. And then God knew I was ready. So I was sitting at one of these deals. An al day we had in Toronto. I was sitting at the back. And this woman, actually a, a woman sitting beside me left. And Lise came over and sat beside me. I had never met her before. I kind of looked over and thought, saw this beautiful blonde and thought, the drought just might be over. <laughs> she gets real mad when I use that line. But anyway, I use the line. Yeah. And I just re- reached out my hand and said, hello, I'm Rick. And she said, yes, I know who you are. Blew up my ego. Um, but that was all I did. Because I, I believe so strongly, and I'll use this word, kind of religious word, but I believe in the sanctity of our rooms. I believe that when we come here, we need to be safe. We need to come here to find out, to hear people share their experience in working these steps to get to their higher power. You don't need to come here being afraid that someone's going to come pick you up. However, we do meet people here, and I did. So I waited six weeks. I started another, another event, and it, meant it was a lovely meeting. Again, we talked, and I left. It didn't do anything. But I wanted to meet her. I wanted, to, I wanted to take her on a date, so this is what I did. Instead of going to her meeting, kind of doing a 13-step thing, I didn't do any of that. I called a friend of hers. The friend's name is Christine, and I said, Christine, will you call Lise for me and ask her if I can have her phone number and tell her that it is not an Al-Anon call? Not an Alan on call. This is a guy call. And so Christine did that for me. And phoned back a few days later, said, here's Lisa's number. She said you could call. Then I thought, well, God, what do I do now? <laughs> it's been four years. Does it still work? I don't know. And so I, I took a while to call her. And so then I called. And hey, when, you're, you know, when you're kind of older and you start doing this stuff, so her son answered the phone. Oh, God. 20 year old son and I'm phoning to ask his mother out on a date so I said is your mom there no she's not here okay we'll leave a ma- I left a message called back I called three times before I finally got her and um, she says to me she has said many times and today to this very day that she loves the fact that I started it that way that it was honest from the get go from square one it was honest. And so we went out on a date and a lovely time together. Didn't share our whole stories. Didn't do a fifth step. Didn't get down on our hands or knees and do step three prayer. We didn't do any of that stuff. We went to a restaurant and had sushi. We went for a little walk and I brought her home. I hugged her goodbye and I left. I left. And I went home and I read The Tradition is a Healthy Relationship book. I said, i got to do this different this time. And I talked to my sponsor the next, next day. And I didn't call her the next morning. I waited a few days and I gave her a call. I'd like to see you again. Would that be okay? So yeah, that'd be nice. So we went out on a second date and a third date. And then I started to feel the energy come. That kind of driving forward, that speed. Let's rev this up. 
So we went for a little walk, and we sat on a bench by the lake downtown, and I said this to her. I said, honey, I need... I didn't say honey, I said, Lise. Didn't call her honey then. I said, I need to do this slow. I have to do this different. And she said, thank God. So do I. So do I. So I said, if you're in to just take this at whatever pace it's meant to go, I'd really love to keep seeing you. She said, me too. (laughs) God... And that's how that worked for us. Now, none of us realized, neither of us realized that slow meant nine and a half years. But um, what happened, and that means sex too, by the way, that got to go slow as well. And, and it was so different when that finally became a natural part of our relationship. Because in the past, it was like a, a frantic, I got to get to know you quick. So that's the way to do it. And it's so opposite what it is. But when, it, when, the, when the physical sexuality became an extension of an emotional intimacy, it was a landmark experience. And it wasn't like some of those old things, you know, you giggle, but you know, okay, you know, the earth moved. It kind of wasn't like that. It was just this gentle, beautiful sharing that felt natural instead of forced. And, and when it was done, it felt safe. And I had never experienced that in my life before. And then there was this issue with her children. She has three grown children. At the time, they were 15 up to 21, and I didn't know how to deal with the kids. I, don't, I have no children. And so this is the wisdom that my sponsor gave to me. She said, Rick, it's attraction rather than promotion. She said, who you are is good enough. Do not try to be their dad. Do not try to be their buddy. Just be who you are And then, listen to this, let the kids come to you. Wow. Because when I'd come over to visit her, her 15-year-old son would grunt at me, bump me as he walked by. That's how that was in the beginning. It was a tough one. I didn't try to replace his dad. I didn't try to ingratiate myself to him. I didn't go overboard trying to be friendly to him. I wasn't buying him things. I didn't do anything like that. Just being in relationship with his mother, and I was being as friendly to him as I could be. And over time, things started to change with Philip. And he slowly would would start to talk every once in a while when I came over. He wasn't grunting at me anymore. And when he graduated from teachers, not teachers, when he graduated from art college, he needed a a place to stay for a couple of months before he got a house with some other friends. And I had an upstairs apartment in my house that I was getting ready to sell that was empty. So Phil moved in with me, this son that used to grunt at me and it was an amazing thing what Phil and I were allowed to develop apart and separate from his mother and then uh, just uh, about four months ago uh, the the daughter of the three children had a baby and there I am 20 minutes after the baby's born in the delivery room with Lise her three children her ex-husband, the ex-husband's new wife and this brand new 20 minute old child that I'd never seen in my life and this boy, Philip, who used to grunt at me and bump me as he walked by, reached out and shook my hand and said, Hey, Rick, congratulations. You're going to be a really important part of this little kid's life. God. And all I did was show up and be who you have taught me how to be. It's attraction rather than promotion. Her daughter, the daughter that had the baby, whenever they bring the baby over, says, say hello to Grandpa Rick. I have no children, but I have this child of my partner who has welcomed me in to the point where the name that she is teaching, going to teach her son of me, is Grandpa Rick. It just stuns me. It stuns me that that can happen. For Christmas last year, Julianne is her name. She gave me a little book, 100 Things to Do with Your Grandchildren. I'm not even a dad. I skipped a step. But I'll tell you, I love this little kid. (laughs) It's an amazing, amazing thing. Julianne asked me and her her husband asked me to do the prayer at their wedding. The the, uh, kind of the grace before meals. What a perfectly appropriate way to have asked me. And all I did, my friends, was show up. Attraction and be the best person that I could be. And with her oldest son, I just I helped him build a deck in the summer. He's not a great talker. But he's a great doer. And we just spent time 
together. Built a deck and it's a house that he bought. And a relationship has grown with Derek and I as well that I really value. In the nine and a half years that Lisa and I have been together, we split up two times. We needed time apart. And each time we did, I didn't keep phoning her. I let her have the space she needed and I, need, I took the space that I needed. And each time she came back. And I was grateful for that. And as we, as we moved along and started to talk about building a life together, we started to need to make these decisions. We needed to make decisions about how we were going to live, where we were going to live, how we were going to sell. And it's been a long, a long period, a couple of years of trying to prepare a house, sell a house in this market, um, go to mediators, how do you work things out? How do you be self-supporting? when you're sharing the money. We had to go to a mediator to find this out. And this is what we found out, because we couldn't get by it. And this is what the mediator said. Equal participation doesn't mean the same amount of money. It doesn't mean each person is putting in 50-50. It means that each person is participating proportionally given what they have. So A, you accept what you've got. You make X, I make Y. Get a proportion of that, and you each contribute based on that proportion, and that is equal because you're contributing equally to whatever, in whatever in the, to the best of your ability. That was landmark for us in how to do that, and that's what's allowing us to feel fully self-supporting as a couple in the relationship because it doesn't have to be 50-50, but it needs to be equal, and it's equal for us proportionally. And that's, again, part of that communication thing. We need to talk about the nitty-gritty details. When we bought our house, we found our house on July 5th. Actually, July 4th. 11 o'clock in the morning and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we had gone back to see it again. We loved it. The agent said, do you want to make an offer? We said, no, we need to pray about this. So we went back to her house. We had lunch. We talked about it, and we prayed. We put in an offer. The offer expired. We didn't put in another one after we took a look at all the finances. And uh, there was a bidding war thing happening, and so we pulled out, let the house go. Five o'clock was the time that they were going to accept the bids. Six o'clock, the agent called and said, the buyers refused the one bid they had. They're asking you to submit one. We had let it go. We had prayed a bless it or block it prayer. And for us, the fact that there was a second offer was a block it. So we said, hey, we'll do that. We'll offer 10000 less. <laughs> and we did. And we got the house. Just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. We had let it go completely. And they called back and said, look, we're, we'll accept an offer. It was unbelievable. So we took that as a real blessing. And that's part of everything we've done. We take this down. Bless it. Listen to that prayer. Bless it or block it. This is what we think we'd like to do. Bring God in. And we communicated about it all. And we moved in three weeks ago, 22nd of September. And uh, our, our challenges now are the small stuff. Whose dishes do we use? So we now have kitchen cupboards with one side her dishes and the other side mine. We haven't resolved that one yet. So the resolution was, let's try, try them both. Whose dining room set do we use? Hers is in the basement, mine's in the dining room, ready to sell. <laughs> You kind of get hung on the practical stuff. But each time we bring God in and we say, okay, this is what we'll do for now. Each time. So it's just, just a, an amazing thing. And I consider her. When I get an invitation to come to one of these things, and I, I do one of these once a month. And when I get these invitations, I always say, I, 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 if I'm free, I'd love to come, but I need to ask my partner. And I'm not asking permission to go per se, but what I'm doing is I'm considering her. Hey, hon, you're primary. And do we have it? anything on. And these things often come like a year or two in advance. She says, I haven't got a clue. Go. Okay, great. But I always consider her before I fully, before I say yes. And what that indicates is you are important. My actions indicate she is important. All stuff, certainly. My mother. Step nine, we make amends. This is the despicable thing I used to do to my mother. That mother that brought me to Alateen. That mother that has been there for me every step of the way. I used to laugh at my mother if she made a mistake with her speaking. She pronounces words funny. She's from the east coast of Canada. And I'd laugh at her in front of people and ridicule her. I mean, it was really despicable. When I was a young child, I, when I was, was a teenager, I was an altar boy. My mother took great pride in the altar uniform that I 
wore it. She made sure it was pressed and looked great. She just loved it. And one Christmas Eve, my mother brought my altar boy uniform into the back, and I was mad at her, and I screamed in front of all the other altar boys and the priests, I hate you, in front of everybody, and my mother. So I made my amend to my mother. The way I make amends is, this is what I've done, fess up to it, how can I make that up to you? And she looked at, she thought, and she looked at me, and she said, Rick, all I want you to do is give me a call regularly and show up for dinner every once in a while. All my mother wanted was a relationship with her son. And we show up, like it says in Tradition 5, we welcome and we give comfort. We show up. So I call her regularly. She's been sick the last little while. and so She was in the hospital, and so when, after convalescing, after one of our operations, I said, hey, Mom, do you want to go down to the chapel? So I put my little mom, she's about five foot two, weighs about 90 pounds, in this massive wheelchair, wheeled her down into the chapel, and we simply sat there and said a prayer together, my mother and I. It's just a stunning moment. And she has to go to an eye clinic every six weeks, and I bring her down, and on the way back she says, you know, you must get sick of you know, bringing me down here and back. I said, Mom, it's a privilege. And she says, hey, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, Mom, I'll be your chauffeur. <laughs> she loved it. Because, you see, I'm showing up for my mom. And the mom that who I really treated so poorly, I'm simply showing her love and letting her know that she's important to me. Now, I, I'm just going to end. I, I have a whole things, I, a bunch of things I can choose from. I'd just like to, um, to tell you about my sister. And um, I hardly ever talk about my sister, Penny. But she was in the midst of that alcoholic hell with me. And when we look back, we'll often say, where was Penny? Well, Penny was hiding, kind of like a herd animal in the corner in the midst of all the fighting. I was in the middle, but Penny had retreated. And my sister had a hard time with school. I did not. I did very well in school. My sister had a very hard time in school. And so when she was young and we were trying to teach her to read, she couldn't get it. So they'd say, Rick, you know, why don't you help her out? And, and I'd holler at her, I'd scream at her, I'd berate her, and it's like, ah! And in the midst of all the stuff that went on at home, you know, I'd always say, oh, Penny, you go, you know, Rick will, Rick will handle this, this was my deal. And it was just, it was really... I had such guilt about the way I treated my sister. And as I started making these amends, I thought, well, I just need to do more than my sister and say, this is what I did, how can I make that up to you? And so I did that. But I needed to show up again for Penny. So my sister had owned a house, and she couldn't keep it any longer, and she needed it. She was going to move in with my mother. So I said, look, I'll build you the apartment. I love working with my hands. So I built her a basement apartment. And she still lives in it to this very day. And that was the beginning of a relationship of her brother, showing up with her and not berating her. And not too long ago, she divorced her husband, and um, we were it was actually after a holiday meal, and she, we were sitting together in the front room, and she said to me, she said, will you be there for me if anything happens? And I said, Penny, you can take it to the bank that I will be there. Because from this brother who had berated her and called her stupid, and act, sometimes you know we can show people that we think they're stupid without our words. Just the way we act, the way we treat them, the way, hey, I'll do that for you because I know you can't do it because you're too dumb. You know, we're not, that's not the word to say, but when we just say take things away from them, we don't believe they can do things. And so what I'm saying here now is that, hey, you are, you can do things. And I value you. And the way she looks after my mother, she's an angel. And I tell her that a lot. And the relationship with my sister, the one single sister I have in the world, has expanded so well. And Lise loves her and she gets along so well with Lise. And, it's just a beautiful thing. Get another of the ongoing, ongoing improvement in relationships that can happen when we simply say, I'm willing to do this different. I'm willing to get me out of the equation. I'm willing to get this selfishness out of the equation. I'm willing to be who I am. I'm willing to be dependable. I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to give you a little bit, a level of autonomy so that you can have a life. I'm willing to share with you so that we can both feel that we're self-supporting. I'm willing to make this commitment to unity with you. And it is working for me. I can't thank you enough for inviting me to Georgia. This is my first trip here, and it is absolutely spectacular. What a gorgeous group of people you are, attentive and, and, and welcoming and friendly and, uh, and just blessings to you all. And thanks for being here this afternoon.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.